Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Sunday Roast. It's Sunday the 20th of October. I'm Phil Carroll. And I'm Kevin Hornsby. And I'm Charles Archer. What a week. I mean, feeling a bit under the weather. I think most of the family has had some sort of cold, I don't know, rhinovirus or whatever it is, or new variant of COVID that seems to be flinging around in the last week. Anyone else feeling suboptimal? I know, well, most of my family are sick again. I'm, I'm once again <laughs> healthy and fine. And they're all sort of like... How do you they, evade it, Charles? How do you evade it? You, you, it's, your it's, kid is, you're picking your kid up and he's vomiting on the, on the, oh, all over the know, carpet. <laughs> I think it's, it, it's this really cool thing called like diet and exercise. And it just, you know... It's, it's, you know, a decent amount of whiskey to kill all the germs and your mouth helps. But it's it's this kind of like, it's this amazing thing where like if you run and lift weights and eat vegetables, you don't get sick as often. It's, it's just incredible. It's just it You do look a bit healthier than you did a couple of months ago. Oh, where, uh, I've done, I've done this, this really cool thing where, where I've adapted to just working a lot and it's fine. And just sort of just accept your lot in life rather than the stress of habit. You can you look like you've been sat on the beach for the past... 20 years or so yeah yeah well uh, i was in and out the mediterranean quite a few times this week i'm back in cairo now but uh yeah uh, it was my office for a large part of the week yes i was uh i was the only person in the in, on the entire beach uh, unless my children were with me so yeah it was okay right. it was so, okay but now i'm back in cairo so um, yeah not that that's any less stressful today's friday which in the middle east is the weekend mm. so friday saturday is the weekend, so we're off to some sports club thing this afternoon. And, uh, yeah, we'll probably jump in the pool before we go because it's 30 degrees centigrade still here. So, uh, yeah. We need, to, we need to move abroad, Phil. I think we've had enough. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, off, I'm off to New York in the coming week, and apparently it's 22 there at the moment. So let's, uh, let's see what that one brings. I mean, I was down in Zambia, but you're absolutely right. There is something about getting away in sort of autumn in the UK where it just feels like it's rained for the last eight months and kind of just enjoying that sun on your face in the morning. And uh, as Kev says, you know, sitting on a, an empty beach and listening to the waves lapping is something that uh, we can only dream of now. But let's have a look at some of the news stories that have dominated the headlines. I mean, did you see the UK's International Investment Summit at the beginning of, of week where Labour emphasised stability and it laid out plans to invest in key areas? There was The summit saw commitments of some £63 billion in private investment with Labour signalling further plans to drive economic growth through strategic investment. So obviously a £22 billion black hole, but in terms of private investment, what, what did you make of some of these investments? Did you see that you had things of like Iberdrola, there was like £12 billion for energy projects over four years, including £4 billion for East Anglia, wind farms, there was Blackstone, £10 billion to build one of Europe's largest data centres in Blythe. What do we make of all these private um commitments i think i think that um there, there's two there's a few things there. i mean the first is a lot of these have already been announced under the last government but you know don't take that away i think i think like the key takeaway is terms of the long-term investments in things like data centers or solar farms or wind farms those are all still going ahead regardless because you're talking about um 20 30 40 years of potential returns through various tax regimes right so whether for example capital gains tax goes up it'll come back down in the future go up again go down they don't mind because they're investing over a multi-decade span. And I kind of noticed with all of that investment, or literally all £63 billion of announcements, it wasn't short-term plans that might materialise in the next year or two. It's stuff they're going to build over the next five to ten years. And so, you know, you're, you're planning for like a much longer investment. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And and what about, uh, Kev's talked about this on, on various boards, the, the impending, obviously, budget on the 30th of October. We, we just saw news that Rachel Reeves may introduce an NI increase for employers, possibly extending NI to employee contributions to workers' pension pots as well. Mm -hmm. um, although Labour, obviously, the manifesto in 2024 pledged not to raise NI for employees, the distinction between employer NI has been emphasised by ministers. So what do we make of that? I mean, I think it's going to claw back some of about 15 billion uh, of the 22 billion black hole. It's, it's complex, isn't it? I think, um, you know, obviously you, you can argue the toss forever about whether Labour is going to break the manifesto or not, the pledges, but um, the country needs money. There is a black hole. Having said that, half of this, you know, magic black hole they've created is the public sector pay rises, which they've, you know, put through. But then the public sector is arguably underpaid. We have this kind of situation now where um, kind of really paradoxically the tax rates in the UK are so high above sort of 50,000 in earnings that you need to put money into a pension 
in order to reduce your marginal rate to like a region, reasonable level. And so going after sort of employer national insurance, yes, it might feel like an easy win for the government, but what it means is that employers will be less likely to take people on. And then next year when pay rises are being talked about, there'll be less of a budget to yeah. do them. So wage, wages are not going to go up in line no, with no. 4%. It'll drop back because they want to claw back the, the national insurance contributions. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, obviously, if you at the moment, wages are increasing above inflation, right? Yeah. That, you know, obviously, you don't feel as wealthy as you did five years well, ago. Well, if you look at anyway, the triple but... lock, lock currently, if you look at the triple lock pension, they're going to they're gonna rise in line with wages, which is around well, 4%. Well, oh, yeah, so to the triple lock for pensioners go up by 4.1%, but benefits going up by one7 and this month, yeah. CPI, CPI inflation is 1.7% in the month when benefit rises are decided. And you're looking at that and going, hmm, <laughs> mm, this stupid. particular month, right, I'm sure next month it'll be 24 or something. But, you know, it's neither here nor there, really. I, I think the biggest thing is, is as a country, we, we spend about £1.4 trillion pounds a year and we raise about £1 billion pounds a year in taxes and other, you know, sources of income. There's a 400 billion ish gap. I mean, you could argue it's 200 billion, depending on what kind of auditing you're using. But the basic point is, you either need to raise taxes, assuming you can raise more money from raised taxes, and that's an argument, or you need to cut spending. I mean, I'd argue we need to cut spending quite drastically across a lot of the government, but no one seems to want to do that because it, it's marketed as austerity. But maybe we're just spending too much for how much we actually raise as a country. And as I go, as now we have a Labour government, they are not going to want to spend less. They yeah. are about they are about big government. They want to spend more. But I think, um, it's, yeah, yeah, Cam, it's, I mean, it's... the pension side of things is quite interesting that because we've been saying for twenty years we've got a pension pension time bomb on our hands, as in there's not enough money in pensions. Okay, mm-hmm. so let's tax the money that companies put into a pension and. Those companies have the right to have as little or as much put into those pensions as they wish, up to a minimum, or sorry, with a minimum of 3%. Yeah. So how many companies now are going to employ somebody new? Maybe they can't do it with their previous employers or employees, but they're going to employ somebody new and they're going to say your pension contribution from us is 3%. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, the other, the other thing, it's this kind of general degradation of sort of, um, of timelines in terms, in terms of careers and buying houses and having children and retiring because yeah. houses are, you know, way more expensive than they used to be compared to wages. So you have a situation where people are buying a house later, they're having children later, so they're having fewer of them. They have student loans, they have to pay off half the country anyway which don't get wiped for 40 years now. And then on top of that, you know, so you might you might get a 40-year mortgage at the age of 35 and have 40 years of student loans to pay back and mm. have children in your late 30s that aren't out of the house until your 60s. And then you have no retirement savings because the pensions have been gone after. Um, but we also have mobility now, which we never had. That is true. So you can 30, leave 40 the country. Years ago. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, somebody going to live abroad was like pretty... Pretty not strange, but it was like you know, pretty big, rare. Uh, yeah. A lot of people went to Spain, but to go to Spain or to go to another European country wasn't like you weren't moving too far abroad. All your benefits were still there if you if you were in the EU. But now you you know you're making a decision, aren't you? Your pension. If you go to the EU now, your pension will still be your pension. But when you leave, I I I assume it's now going to be the same rules as. Uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, where when you leave, your pension doesn't get uh, increased once yeah, you leave. It's, it's frozen, yeah. effectively, isn't it, at the time of leaving, yeah? Yeah, so you leave, and if you're on a pension of £200 a week, then you're going to get £200 a week yeah. for the rest of your life. But that, subsequently, is probably one of the only decisions, because you say property. Well, most places in the in the world, especially where the sun shines, it's cheaper to buy a property. Yeah, yeah than in the UK, and that's what people maybe want. And we also have a population as well that can work remote, and COVID's proved to them they can work remote as well, a lot more than uh, they did before. So, yeah, it's it's a strange situation. What, what do we make of capital gains tax? Because obviously we, we, we've talked about the fact that they might um, increase that, obviously, to align the tax people pay on these unearned wealth. So... You, we, just, oh, just to say at the moment, this this is triggered when profits for shares or property are more than 3,000, but with obviously SIPs and ISAs, they're exempt. But 
that this is a number for you. There are an estimated 12.5 million private shareholders, but the tax is paid by only 350,000 people a year, showing that only a minority of shareholders have more than £3,000 invested. Or should we say, make more than three thousand pounds? Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, <laughs> I think, well, I think that's, that's a better. I think that's a better statement than the paper. Well, it's it's you know okay. So like I was I was I was talking to my dad about this actually. You know because I'm only in my sort of mid late ish thirties. You know, Kev is a bit older than me. Phil were about the same age. I think you're a little bit older. But in the UK, right? In terms of like when he was starting his business. You know, you had uh, you had entrepreneurs release up to, uh, relief up to ten million pounds. That's now business asset disposal relief, and only one million, right? Yeah. You had capital gains allowance of twelve thousand three hundred, even more it was, and now it's three thousand. You had a dividend allowance. It used to be dividend tax credit. You didn't pay any tax on dividends up till twenty sixteen, and now it's, it it became a dividend tax allowance of five grand. Now that's down to five hundred. It's probably about to get scrapped. Dividend tax has gone up. They're talking about putting capital gains tax up again. I mean, they were saying 39%, but really they're fishing to make it sound not so bad when, when it comes in at sort of, you know, 29, 30. But every single year, they keep putting taxes up on wealth creators. And when you talk about this, like, really small pool of, like, 300, 400,000 people paying capital gains tax, what you need to understand is that the average person is going to fill up their SIP with their 60 grand allowance and their ISA with their 20 grand allowance. If you then have more money left over, I think it's pretty reasonable you pay capital gains tax on that, right? You're, you're doing extremely well. But those 300, 400,000 people, they're not the average, you know, earner. They're the wealth creators. They're the entrepreneurs. They're the people generating huge amounts of wealth and driving jobs and already paying a lot of tax. Do you really want to push them out of the country? And like a really classic yeah. example for me, I could go get a pay job on a decent salary and, and pay, you know, relatively not that much tax. You know, or, you know, say equivalent tax. And if they're going to say, right, capital gains is going to go really high and they're going to scrap it as a disposal relief, then they're effectively saying that you're going to pay the same amount of tax if you take a risk starting a business as you do just being an employee. So yeah. why would anyone start a business? With well, all that's the, the thing. Is, what, what is the motivation now, Charles, for these, you know, entrepreneurs who are thinking about putting, you know, money into a business or setting something? I mean, I saw one of the Labour donors come out and, uh, the, you know, who donates about five million a year. And he said something along the lines of, oh, corporation tax shouldn't be more. It should, you know, 25% is nothing. It should be 50% or 30 And I'm thinking... Oh. What planet is he living on where anybody thinks that you should increase corporation tax? Well, it's just mad. And I mean, there's two things here. The first is that um, if you, if you know, I run a, I run a business, if it, it, corporation tax is calculated annually, right? So, for example, what I would like to do is save up a million pounds, and then and then use that to build something much bigger. But it's harder because you have to pay the tax every year, so it becomes sure. very difficult to do. But the second thing is, you only have to look across the sea at Ireland. Our corporation tax rate is effectively 25% unless you're a very small business. In Ireland, it's 12.5%. Ireland has more corporation tax income than they know what to do with. They're actually struggling to find ways to spend it. This is completely true. You look at the headlines, read the articles. A lot of it is Apple money, right? Yeah. But you come to the UK and, and, and our corporation tax. I mean, I'm trying to think of that. Our, I think we raise 88 billion a year in corporation tax, something along those lines. And then like cigarettes and alcohol raises a quarter of that. You know, so a quarter of our corporation tax income as a government, it, 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 you know, in uh, comparative amount ratio, is cigarettes and alcohol alone. So this high corporation tax rate, it just doesn't work. Yeah. It, it's just madness. So I think we should reduce it. Personally, I reduce it to ten percent, and and you just watch the business um, income yeah, just flow really fast. Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Yeah, I'll and, and that was the promise of Brexit. No, that was the promise of Brexit, and then the promise of Brexit then turned into let's increase corporation tax from nineteen percent to twenty five percent. Yeah, the, you know, it went the other way. When yeah. actually, if we want to take a long term view of how to build the British economy, it isn't to tax the current situation more. We have to attract more people to want to go into the UK to build a exactly. business. Yes, hundred percent. But, but we're not doing that. It's it's you know literally in the past two or literally in the past, genuinely two or three years, my corporation tax like yours has gone up from nineteen to twenty five percent. So if you were, you earn a hundred grand, you know you used to pay nineteen grand tax, and now that's two you know twenty five thousand effectively six grand more, and then your dividend tax has gone up as well, and your dividend allowance has gone down too. So you're effectively paying 10 grand more tax a year, 10% more than what you were three years ago. How is that incentivizing anyone to come to the UK when you go to Dubai and pay zero? 
Okay. Zero. Let's have a look at another thing that Kevin and I talked about this week. Want your take on it, Charles? Obviously, mm. we saw the announcement that there's potential that they might remove the business relief from the inheritance tax, which could obviously have far-reaching consequences for for the AIM uh, market. So, you know, we we know that AIM's ability to attract new listings or raise funds, which has obviously already been severely impacted in the last mm. sort of you know year, year and a half, probably even further. 15.3% of AIM's value tied to inheritance tax planning. The implications are obviously pr- particularly severe. So what are your thoughts on it if Reeves does impose this? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, because I work with private companies as well, and I know you guys too do too to some extent. Private companies get, you know, enterprise investment schemes, for example, venture capital schemes. It's easier to raise capital. It's better, you know, that you have more advantages for investors compared to being on AIM. Being listed on AIM, you know, I think with salaries and lawyers and nomads probably costs about a million pounds a year nowadays i mean you can shave it down a bit so to get rid of this tax relief now could be you know a hammer blow there's two things i would say about it though the first is the tax itself is pretty poor in terms of it's it makes sense to have inheritance tax exemptions on unlisted companies because you're trying to build them but i think it's it's not a well targeted tax but what you should do if you're going to get rid of it is you should replace it with something else so for example the rumors going around the city is potentially, and I'll say these are only rumours, if you hold, um, they'll get rid of the AIM uh, inheritance exemption, but if you buy AIM shares and hold them for two years, there's no capital gains tax to pay. That'll be the switch around, which could be quite fun. But I I think the other thing, you know, people talking like a mass sell-off, if that does come in, and obviously that is possible, but a lot of stocks at the lower end of the market are already relatively illiquid. If you have a thousand people trying to sell shares, because they, they don't want to be you know in them anymore because of the inheritance tax implications, and you don't have any buyers, the share price might fall, but it actually the value of the company has, hasn't changed at all. And actually, how far can a share price fall if you don't have any buyers on the other side of the equation? I, I think it would be a bad idea to do it in this budget. I do think that the way AIM is funded and the way um, the incentives around tax around AIM need to change. And I'm quite concerned, for example, that um, we could be in a world, you know, literally a couple of weeks from now, where if you invest in a company that's, you know, EIS qualifying, you can get loss relief, capital gains relief, inheritance tax relief, and all sorts of other goodies. And yet, if you go to AIM, then you get none of that, and the virtually no liquidity, and companies can't raise capital. So something needs to change. But it's definitely not just putting the plug on one of the you know reliefs that that makes it worth investing in at the moment without replacing it with something better. What do you think, Bill? Yeah, I, I'm I'm in agreement. I think that it could be. I mean, we, as we've already said in the past, this aim is is pretty much being hammered, isn't it? As we as uh, you know, we've seen companies delisting. I think this could be the death knell of pe- pension funds relying on it, investments in there. If they start pulling their investments out, we've seen what how little how illiquid a lot of these stocks are. It could finish the the, the aim market entirely. Yeah. Well, let's let's hope not. I think it, it's worth you know just saying. I think I don't believe they'll do it in this budget. Because at the moment, they're kind of running around putting fingers and it's actually quite complex to do. And then you'll get all sorts of legal challenges, you know. Yeah. But um, I, I do think that it's it's a poor incentive in terms of it's it's because the whole point of inheritance tax, except, you know, trying to avoid inheritance tax is you want company which if you want to avoid inheritance tax, you want wealth preservation, right? Yeah. You want to take your two million pounds you want to pass on to your family and you want to put it in a company where that two million pounds is not probably going to grow, but it's not going to fall either which is the opposite of what AIM is meant to be about. AIM is meant to be about sort of fast growth and generating like, so higher risk companies, but high growth companies. And so, in, you know, an inheritance tax incentive is kind of the worst possible incentive to have on a growth index. What would be far more attractive would be loss relief on AIM shares, for example, like with EIS, yeah. or at the very least, you know, I think 0% or maybe 5% capital gains if you hold the shares for five years. If you pick a company, you know, like um, Priority AI, right, which is, which is coming to the market very shortly, they've got really great prospects, but they're an early stage. They're, you know, a growth company. Early investors should not have to pay capital gains because the amount of growth, if it succeeds, and the amount of wealth it's going to create for the country means that you should be rewarded for that risk. Yeah. Not your children, and, and, and also the risk that you're putting in on pre IPO. IPO, you know, you, you don't get re- any refund when you don't get your money, you know, when you, you lose yeah. your money if it doesn't come to market. So, yeah, well, 100%. You can put, you know, I put 10, 20 grand in things sometimes, and so just they, lost they, it. they're happy yeah. to take the money from that end, but they, they won't refund it on any, on any risk taking as well, you know what I mean? No. So, it's kind of so. I want to get Kev's take on one other thing I want to talk about, which is is the pension side of things. There's been talk that they the, the current tax free sum that you can take from your pensions. 
circa a quarter of a million pounds at the moment. They're talking about maybe dropping it to a hundred thousand pounds. Kev, what are your thoughts on that? Well, again, uh, pensions the easy pot, isn't it? Because ultimately, this this pot is fixed; it can't be moved. It's under legislation. I was involved in pension planning from the late the late eighties, uh, if you like, or early nineties, sorry, I should say, and. You've just seen pensions being the easy target the whole way through. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago that your your tax free cash lump sum was unlimited. You know, you could take if you had five million pound pot, you could take one point two five million. It was it was there. So this this limit only came in when they when they introduced the um, the amount of money that you can actually have in your pension pot. So I mean, you could have put in fifty thousand pounds into one share, and that share like went to the moon and you suddenly had four million pounds uh, and you were going to get absolutely hammered. So what do I say about it? I think I think it's a bit sneaky, really, because ultimately these people have been investing this money for a long period of time, mm. uh, having growth. And on the premise, when they were sold those products, ima- I put it this way. Imagine if the government was a financial services company and the financial services company did something that said, now you can only get 10% tax-free income or tax, tax-free tax sum instead of 25%. What would happen? What what would be the situation? Lawsuits. Lawsuits everywhere. Lawsuits yeah. galore. These companies would be the worst thing in the entire world, et cetera, et cetera. And now the government is basically doing the same thing. Do, do I think it's right? I, I think you can do it. You can't. I don't think you should be able to do it retrospectively. But if someone takes a pension now, under the understanding that that's the new r- rules, yeah. Okay. Well, I think it's um. The, you know, there's two things here. I mean, for me, it's it's a lot of people do financial planning. Pensions are not in isolation, right? For example, you might have a mortgage with two hundred and fifty grand left on it at the age of sixty, and you're expecting to take that tax free cash to pay off your mortgage. So, yep. for example, and and the other thing is is you know we're all kind of higher runners, I would say, but a lot of people aren't. So you have a lot of people who get sort of 60 or 65 or want to take their pension. And that's the first time, potentially the only time in their life, they're going to be flush with cash to enjoy, you know, mm-hmm. potentially. The rest of their pension is to live off into retirement. But you can go do that one-off holiday. You can go do that one-off amazing thing or buy that car or whatever else that you've never been able to do in your whole life. And I think there's an element of that, you know, pension planning is about, you know, saving for retirement, but also yeah. it, you should be able to, you know, enjoy your pension. It's like, it's like the midlife crisis p- payment. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Like the it's guy, 57. The guy works, God, like he goes no. out and buys, oh, goes and buy a Jaguar convertible or an Aston Martin, you know, he enjoys it. And then he goes on a, a cruise around the world for 90 but, days. You know, you know, it's it's in Australia, right? This is why I much prefer the Australian system. They have almost an ISA style system for the pension. So... You're taxed on your income, you put the income into your pension, and then when you withdraw it, it's completely tax-free. And so what they do is the Australian government is they can change the tax rates, you know, on your income, so you can put less into your pension, but they don't fiddle out with, with, fiddle about with what happens at the end. Whereas in the UK, we tend to fiddle with both, you know, uh, how much you're allowed to put in year by year and what your your relief rate might be. And also whether you're going to get taxed at the end of it. Mm-hmm. And the risk is, for example, with, with higher earners, if you say, right, we're going to we're going to reduce the amount of relief you get, tax relief, when you put money into your pension at the start, and also we're going to tax you more when you withdraw the money at the end, at what point will people go, well, this isn't an incentive at all, and my tax rate is over 50% anyway, and I'm 55, I'm going to retire, I'm done, yeah. and the government loses 20 years of productivity. Okay, let's move on to something a little bit more sobering. We saw the news that Liam Payne, former One Direction star, died at 31 after falling from a third-floor hotel in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Police found Payne's body following an emergency call in Palermo. Preliminary autopsy revealed external and internal bleeding. Alcohol and medication were discovered in his room. Police were initially responding to reports of an aggressive man under the influence when they heard a loud sound from the hotel courtyard where they later found Payne's body. Police investigation is underway and the body has been transferred to a morgue. Ferguson, Rebecca Ferguson, his co-star, posted a tribute to Payne on X, writing, It's always a hotel room. We both met at Euston Station, shared the taxi together to X Factor, young, innocent and unaffected by fame. I can't help but think... I can't help but think of that boy who was hopeful and looking forward to his bright future ahead. If he hadn't jumped on the train and jumped in it, I believe he would be alive today. 
I've spoken for years about the exploitation and profiteering of young stars and the effects many of us are still living with the aftermath and PTSD. Many of us are devastated and reflective today as it is finally taking its first victim. So firstly, obviously, very sad news on that. But what do you make of the whole comment about, you know, that, that maybe it's wise for record companies to have psychologists on the books? You know, this, this young lad, he came to stardom at the age of between 14 and 16 when he was on X Factor. And all he's lived with is being an, almost like a number one rock star with One Direction. How do you cope with that level of fame? Well, I think it's, um, I mean, look at every child actor, right? I mean, one or two are fine, but the vast majority have mental health issues. Yeah. Something needs to change in the industry. But the, the reality is that, you know, we're, we're going to continue to have child actors and child singers. You know, I, I think often often the other thing is, it, particularly when it comes to singing, plenty of people peak as children, right? So to deny them the ability to share that talent with the world is also unfair. But, you know, the reality is that, okay, I'm not a famous person, right, really, realistically, other than among maybe a thousand small cap investors in the UK. Um, and a few people on IG. But you laugh, right? You laugh. That's but ambitious, okay. a thousand. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 but no, I'm not. I'm not. You this week there was two or three thousand at one I know, point. Oh, the pot attack. That was super fun. That was a joy. But, um, but the basic point is, right, that like occasionally it stresses me out running that Telegram group when it's super busy and something really big has happened. And, you know, and that's a tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic piece of stress compared to what these children come under would you like to be super famous though would you think there's any joy in it because i can't imagine much worse than having to like wherever you go so people I'm, i like talking to people don't be wrong but when you're being hassled you're with your family you like literally wherever you go you can't be a free person no like, i much... i've i thought about this i would love it but only when my children are older right i think that's it when my youngest is 18 after uni or whatever whatever he chooses yeah. to do you know, when I'm in my sort of mid fifties, I would that'd be amazing. I wouldn't mind being really famous then. But when no, you've and got you've got to children... take the rough with the smooth, either because there's always those those naysayers. I've gonna I was gonna say some worse things than naysayers, but oh, man. there's there's gonna be some people who've just got it in for you. They just oh, yeah, yeah. make your life difficult. So you would know, you like I to think... be famous, Phil? No, I think I've I've heard a few people talk of it recently, and and I think I can't think of much actually worse. I mean, I, I like doing these podcasts, I like meeting people who are interested in in the whole stock talk and 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 you know the the investing side of things. But I think other than that, I'd, I'd run a YouTube channel. But I, I don't I don't think being in, in there's a there's a level of, of of comfort you can work with where people come and talk to you about what yeah. you do. But when you're a rock star and you've got screaming fans, you know, think of the Beatles in in the sixties. Yeah, yeah. I mean, One Direction were effectively the modern version of the Beatles. They took America by storm. But like, I think he summed it up. He did a podcast with um, Steve Bartlett from Diary of a CEO in 2021. And he basically said, we had that much fame. We were effectively locked in our hotel rooms. And what's in a hotel room? A mini bar. So he was having a party for one every single night on his own, getting absolutely hammered, you know, one probably numerous, not just alcohol, but various other substances. And, and if, if you've known yeah, that, that wasn't in the mini bar, that was a choice. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. But ultimately, it, you know, how can you handle that level? And that's all you've ever known. And I do think that Sharon Osbourne tweeted or put on X like we that we failed you. And I think it's easy in hindsight to say that. But ultimately, I do think that some of these marketing and record companies who want to rinse a lot of these young stars and take the profits should mm. actually install psychologists on the books to help with duty. It's a duty of care for well, vul they're vulnerable. Yeah. If you okay, win... I, I definitely don't want to be famous, but I'm going to drag you away from this conversation. Okay. Though it's horrific and very horrible. Did you see the images of burning people in a tent that they had made by a hospital this yeah, week? Yeah, in, in Gaza, yeah. Okay, now yeah. that is tragic. Yeah. I'm sorry to say it, but we come, we come back to the tragedy of what is happening in the world, and some things are, uh, you know a lot more tragic than others and what's happening in Lebanon and what's happening, you know, the Israelis are now, you know, celebrating that they killed this Hamas guy yeah, in Gaza now. Are, the, the architect of the October 7 was, was killed in it by the IDF in an mm. airstrike, wasn't he, this week? Now, if so that was, was the only been... thing they were destroying, we could sympathise with them. Yeah. But it isn't. Tens of thousands of children have been slaughtered. Tens of thousands of children have been maimed, lost a limb lost parents, you know, become effectively orphans. 
what what is going to happen? I mean, we talked earlier about the implications of the future pension time bomb. What have we just created in the last year? And I say we because as the West, in my view, we're just as responsible for this as the Israelis who were doing it because we're sending them the money, we're sending them the bombs, we're sending them. It's horrendous. I cannot, like, it makes my blood yeah. boil of what is actually going on. But anyway, yeah. it's, I mean, on on that one, for, I'm, Kev, I mean, for me, it's, it's simple. Every time you kill a terrorist or anyone related to a terrorist or a civilian, you create three, four, five more terrorists, right? And in their mind, they're freedom fighters. And the problem yeah. is what Israel is doing Unless, you know, they're not going to kill everybody in the Middle East that they you know, surround them. It's just not going to happen. So they're just going to create more hate and more war for the future. Yeah. Uh, I think it's... But it's, genuinely, that's why they're killing some of the children as well, I believe. Yeah, well, they're killing what they think are future soldiers. That's the reality. Yeah. I think that what Israel do, is doing is, is awful, beyond awful. But I also think that this is a region of the world where war has been going on forever and ever and ever. And I, I, I'm not sure that Western intervention actually helps or do we do we actively make the situation yeah. worse by trying to help or is I think the only godsend is that israel have announced that they're not going to target the nuclear facilities as of you know in mm. imminently let's say which could kind of pull back a little bit of the, the escalation but as kev says and, and i do think that uh, you know, although the idf have been complicit in as you say the murdering of probably forty thousand civilians hamas are cowards for hiding in between you know in hospitals and places like that i do think that they should yeah, have they, they, culpability they, I they do, still I do. have they still have the hostages you know yeah. and i think um it's it's but then you know on the flip side of that it's also worth bearing in mind there's plenty of israelis who who are completely against what the government is doing and want yeah. to stop and and you know i think i think it's, but we don't hear any of them no you don't you don't and i think the thing is on the 7th of october when that happened if it had happened to my family you know, or my home, I would want all the revenge in the world. But at some point, you you can either have revenge, which just creates more death, or you can have peace, and you can only pick one. And and, and Israel at the moment is choosing the revenge path, and it makes it harder and harder for there to be peace in the future. Yeah, I don't know that it's even just revenge anymore. It is, it is to me, it looks like a dedicated plan mm. that we are going to push the borders of Israel out. It's as simple as that. Mm. Well, they, they've been doing that for years. Overtake southern Lebanon. There, so you know you're you're in a situation that is the Syrian border in the Golan Heights. The next the next move mm -hmm. is the you know is Gaza going to exist in any form other than sort of a, a military part of of Israel? It's highly unlikely because they've demolished everything. Literally, if you see pictures of it, it's a wasteland. Yeah, and they've destroyed literally everything and. The next target is then going to be the West Bank, that they're going to, uh, you know, not allow the West Bank to uh, survive in the way that it is. And they've been doing this by stealth anyway, yeah, in terms yeah. of, uh, of the settlements. The settlements, yeah. The motorways through so that they're, they're splitting the West Bank, etc., etc. Anyway, I'll get on the soapbox because I'll talk about well, it. Well, we could talk about it. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the scenario is having been to many of these places, having, having seen what I believe is both sides of the story. You know, these people are human beings and this is what we've got to understand. You know, they are human beings. And from that perspective, it is is just hard to see and hard to watch. Whether you're Israeli, whether you're um, in Gaza, whether you're in Lebanon. We've got lots of friends in Lebanon. Me and my wife met when we were in Lebanon. You know, the place is just being destroyed and our, our friends are sitting in the house and they can't go to their jobs, they can't work, they can't drive to places because they just don't know what's going to happen. Could yeah. be a could be a missile or a bomb at any point. It's it's horrific, absolutely yeah. horrific. Yeah, I mean, just to just you know beyond this as well, the other like sort of Damocles over the global economy is China and Taiwan because this is not being yeah. reported very much, but literally every month they're escalating what they're doing in terms of military drills, and China has made it very clear they plan to take up Taiwan by force at some point. Taiwan can, you know, manufactures something like over 90% of the world's semiconductors. So what happens, you know, if China does decide, you know, we're going to go for it? I mean, the very the kind of like kind of skeptical, kind of cynical part of me thinks China is giving the US and Japan enough time to build their own semiconductor factories. But at some point, China is going to do it. What happens to the global economy then? Because what's going on in the Middle East in kind of like on a human level is awful, but that has been going on for a long time. It's just an escalation. 
same with Russia and Ukraine in many ways, uh, specifically with Crimea. But China and Taiwan, I mean, that, 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 that could be the next really big thing that blows up. But when that happens, it's, I don't know, it's all the bets are off the table. I was, I was listening to something on uh, Facebook. It was Candace Owens' interview with a guy that was talking about the flight that went missing, MH something or other. And basically that flight went missing. And one of the reasons why that flight went missing was he, he explained there was 20 semiconductor specialists on that flight mm. that were flying to direct to China. And these people worked for a particular company in the US that had managed to minimize the size of, of the um, semiconductors. And basically, the U.S. made that flight disappear. Was the was the summation of it? Because and this happened twenty years ago or eighteen years ago on the basis that these people were all Chinese nationals and Malaysian nationals that worked for the company in the U.S. So there is a battle going on over semiconductors and how they work and the size of them and the production of them. It's just like when we read the, the book, The Material World, and we must get that guy on as well, you know, about the whole situation around around the semiconductors and, um, you know, where it all comes from and the sand and that, how small that being able yeah. to make them, it's, it's absolutely yeah, miraculous. They're, they're like Taiwan are about 10 years ahead of China in terms of ability to produce, but they have announced um, that they're going to build a plant in Germany as well with one of the big German companies and, and with a grant from the EU. So that, that should take a bit of pressure off. But yeah, I agree with you. But let, let's, let's, let's ask Charles on, um, now move on to some stocks. I want to talk about some helium. We should hand out the, we should hand out the, uh, the tissues at this point, because this is not very, <laughs> uh... <laughs> shall we, right, shall we, let's, shall, let's have an optimistic story before yeah. we move yeah, on to this. Yeah, yeah. Charles, yeah. Charles, optimistic. talk to us about something that's high pitched, like these helium stocks. Oh, uh, helium stocks, helium stocks. Well, you know, helium is essential to semiconductors, but anyway, no, I think, look, here's, what, <laughs> here's what's basically happened, right? Um, because the here, like the timeline is really simple. Helium one, which has diluted its shareholders about a gazillion times, is just you know is is a really really fun trading stock at the moment. Really really popular. Drag, you know they can raise pretty much whatever money they want because they're the potential kind of gold mine at the ra- end of the rainbow. And then Helix did their IPO um, earlier this year, and it was hugely oversubscribed. And then what happened was every other company on the index went, hang on there's a really hot appetite for helium because there's such a scarcity of it. And there's very few companies on the index that are exploring for it. And clearly there's plenty of investors who are prepared to throw money at it. Look at Helix and, you know, how much money they turned down. And then pretty much every, everyone's just gone helpful. There was obviously you had Georgina, um, Mosman, uh, Mendel used to be Voyager is pivoting into it. And, you know, there I think are the micro cap is one to watch as well. Pulsar, they've just been admitted to the market. You've got all these... Um, kind of uh, popular helium shares. I think Hel- Helix is re-entering Ingemar at the moment. So Helix, uh, we are going to get potentially a very positive RNS over the next few days. And then Pulsar with Jetstream 1, really, really interesting as well. So yeah, I, I, I mean, it's just a sector where it's, it's going to get super, super, even more popular and everyone's going to pivot into it. Because I, 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 you know, maybe this is the skeptic in me, but a few years ago, it was quite easy to raise money to explore for oil and gas. And now that's it it's similarly liquid to explore for helium if you say right we've got a potential helium play raising five million to go go after it is actually quite simple now in a market where raising money is virtually impossible in any other sector i think if you've got a squeaky voice they'll give you money now no? a squeaky voice what are From you talking about oh very good very clever <laughs> yeah well i don't know and, and do you know what? the other thing i really like about these plays right especially helix and uh, pulsar is okay so helix has got ingemar and they've got the second asset rudyard mm-hmm. and pulsar's got jetstream one but they raise the money, they're drilling their one well, and they're either going to be successful or not. And the chances of success at both Pulsar and Helix are pretty good. But you know, a lot of um, a lot of a lot of small cap companies who piss about for sort of five years doing surface exploration and then raise more money and dilute and dilute. Whereas with these ones, it's different. It's we've IPO slash RTO'd. We've raised our five million that we need. We've got our drill site. We're going to go drill in this month of the year, and you're going to find out if we're successful by you know, early 2025 that's really attractive because i think of what a lot of what of the investors want now is they want results that can bring you know financial financial returns quickly in this market which is fairly illiquid and people don't have any patience yeah. what do you think yeah well I, I was good to see them come to market i mean as you say they raised about 3.875 million which brings total gross funds i think as you mentioned about 5 million 
I don't really know much about them. They've got the Topaz project and this, this, they want to deepen this, this, um, this jet stream one well, you know, and obviously acquire further seismic data. But there's quite a lot of projects in, in the US, isn't there? Obviously, you know, in Minnesota, you've got Helix, you've got project or projects over in the US as well. So how, how many of these companies actually are exploring? I know, is it Rookwar is the other one, which is, is um, Helium, was it Rookwar, Helium one? In, in, yeah, they bought Rookwar for like a gazillion pounds or whatever <laughs> they have paid yeah. for it. But yeah, I mean, I mean, the basic thing is, um, if I guess this is really important, is that the reason why it, helium is so valuable is commercial discoveries are actually very hard to come across, yeah. right? Um, and what Helix and Pulsar are both going after is like really, really high grade stuff. Now, you know, you can put the money in the ground, but the helium slash hydrogen is either there or it's not there. I think with both of those two, there's a good chance that it is. But, you know, the reality is that there is, you know, it's exploration. If you're hoping to get a 10 times return, then you've also got to accept that you're, you know, on the high curve of the risk. And what you tend to see with share prices is that all the way up until the drilling, it rockets and rockets and rockets and people take their profits. And then if it's successful, it rockets again. So, I, you know, I would say there's also an element of you have to trade it. You have to, you know, be careful about your buying and selling prices. But, um, you know, there, there's room in the market, you know, for all of them to succeed. And it still wouldn't touch the size of the demand. Because the key thing with helium, unlike pretty much any other element, is that you can't manufacture it and you can't replace it with anything else. Yeah. So copper, for example, we talk about the copper supply gap on here quite a lot. If you can't have copper in an application, you can generally replace it with aluminium if you wanted to. If you can't have lithium in a battery, you can use nickel. I mean, it's not optimal, sure. but you can do it. Whereas if you have an MRI processor in, in a hospital, you need helium. And if you don't have helium, it won't work. So, okay. yeah. So what would you, if you had to choose one of those stocks now, you know, from from if you weren't invested in any, any of them, which one would you be looking at in terms of valuation, upside potential? So I think... So Helix, we're going to find out literally in the next few days whether the casing and the re-entry in the Ingemar is um has been successful. So I think Helix, in terms of near-term news, that's the one to go for at the price point that we have now. But we're talking with them in the next week or two. After that, then it's Pulsar because Pulsar has probably got you know the, the largest potential upside, but they're a little bit further away from like near-term news flow. They're like sort of Q one ish. It's when they're going, so a couple of months away from now. So the, both Helix and Pulsar are kind of like neck and neck, but I think they'll almost like, you know, they'll almost trade in a pair, I think, because you have the same, uh, you have o o securities, you have the same broker, the same kind of investors, the same kind of story. Yeah. So the money will flow between those two and you just have to time time what you're doing with both of them. They're both really good. And I think Mendel is one to like really keep an eye on. They've just rebranded from Voyager, but they have sort of, they've got an option to buy into already producing well helium wells. Yeah. And it's a kind of a micro cap. But it's it's one of those. It's a completely different story. It's not going to make you you know millions and millions and millions. But it could be a nice little earner. Um, and if you want something that's a bit lower risk potentially, then maybe that's the one to go for. Are you guys in any of these at all? Does that have interest? No, no, no. Really, not really done much. I mean, obviously yeah. Helium won a long time ago, but not really looked too much into it of late. Um, saw an RNS this week from I think Lorna put out you know a statement on there, but. No, I mean, it's just interesting seeing this sort of, uh, uh, what I'll call a glut of companies, helium companies. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's the sexy mineral of the year, is what we yeah. call it, you know. But we lithium used to be it, you know, a couple of years ago. Gold might be it next year if gold keeps rocketing. Copper's going to be it at some point. But it's just where if you have a reasonable asset in a particular commodity, sometimes that commodity is just hot and raising money is not too difficult. I have done tons of research into these. I, I have a Substack newsletter. It's on my Twitter, that's DocSky. So if you guys want to see, you know, all of the technical information you can, it's all there. But I think, you know, it's just they're just really attractive because a lot of investors on this in, on this market are here for risk plays. And these these companies are effectively you're putting money into the ground and you're going to have an answer whether it's been worth it very quickly compared to a lot of other, you know, if you have the like... Only thing that, the only problem I've got with helium stocks, a bit like the oil and gases, is that it's it's a binary play. It's like, it's yeah. like you know, if you get a duster, it's like 70%. You know, remember when helium hit hit, hit the duster, um, you know, a few years ago? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And it dropped 70 80% in the day. And then obviously, you know, as you say, once they, they almost don't recover and then it's like, it's it's dilution. They issued at like 0.25 or whatever back in the day or 0.2 and they, they issued almost the same number of outstanding yeah. shares and... I think that's the problem with it. It's proper exploration play, isn't it? No, it is. I mean, the good thing with with Helix, they've got two assets. They've got Rudyard and Ingemar. So you've got two bites of the apple, right? And they're both, I would say, equally good. So one doesn't work out. 
I don't think it will crash because you've got another, but if both don't work out, then that's the entire company. Yeah. Pulsar with Jetstream 1 and the assets they have there, they're looking really, really good because they've already drilled it. They already know there's helium there and they just want to go deeper. But yes, you are right in terms of that is the case. If, if, if it's a duster, then that's it. But that's what exploration is about. But then at the same time, I do wonder whether that's a better model because we all know copper companies and gold companies, you know, who have done like the same surface exploration for 10 years on an asset. Or oh, they drilled it and they found nothing and they just keep raising money. Perhaps it's better to say, okay, we looked, we couldn't find it and it's terrible. But yeah. having said that, I mean, I, I just said that and then I just remembered, you know, great and gold. Uh, <laughs> new ones spending about, you know, a gazillion pounds you know, drilling that thing forever and, you know, they found nothing until suddenly they found one of the biggest discoveries in Australia. So yeah. maybe, maybe, I maybe, I maybe it's not a third So, Charles, what is the helium? What, are, what is the main um, practical world use of, of helium? I mean, it's obviously not putting in birthday balloons. So what is the... Uh... Well, birthday balloons are very important, aren't they? I'm amazed that they use it, birthday balloons, given we're going to run out. But yeah. um, there's tons of stuff. Obviously, it's lifting gas. Um, you talk balloons, but also spacecraft, really important. Space exploration, yeah. So, Virgin yeah. Virgin. So, you know, again, I mean, SpaceX is investing in their, you know, quietly investing in their own helium um, exploration because they know they're going to need it. But you also have MRI machines, as I said. So cooling cools things to low temperatures, scientific research. Um, yeah, it's completely inert. So you, things like welding, silicon wafers for computer chips and microchips. You can't make microchips. You can't make semiconductors. You can't have the internet without helium. Electronics, data transmission. Uh, leak detection is a cool one for protecting leaks. Deep sea diving. You can't do deep sea diving without helium oxygen mixtures. Um, medical treatment, you need helium for specific respiratory conditions. Without it, there's a lot of people alive now who wouldn't be. I think, you know, for me, the two what the two ones to keep an eye on, the three ones on medical, so MRI machines, space exploration, um, and and uh, and semiconductors. So effectively and also fiber optics and for making yeah. these things yeah, yeah. as well. So there's massive uses. I mean, and also cryogenics, which will, you know that will come back at some point. But it's just the the key thing with it is that, you know, you can't replace it with anything else. Yeah. This is the big thing. So if there is a copper supply gap, right, and there is, and copper go, you know, goes up 10 times in value and we all walk away with millions, you know, laughing, somebody's out there is going to go, right, we're going to replace our copper with aluminium and it won't be as effective. But even if it's, you know, four times less effective, it's still a hell of a lot better than paying 10 times as much for the copper. With helium, you can't do that. There's no, there's nothing external. And it's actually a kind of a big, a, a bit of a crisis to the point where both Helix, the both Sears, uh, Helix and, and Magenta um, Pulsar, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, both of them have written books about this, you know, best-selling yeah. novels. <laughs> about, well, the thing, yeah. the thing with copper is that copper, copper cannot go up unlimited, as you say, because there yeah. are replacements. I mean, if copper becomes more expensive than silver, you do silver because silver is yeah. a better conductor, but the, the chances of that are, are minimal. But your aluminium substitution is is obviously there. But one other thing that we talked about last week on the Sunday roast with uh, with Sean Wade, which I would like your take on, is the the uranium plays in Canada for power metals. Uh, I don't know whether you listened to the podcast last week when we did the thing with power metals and what you took from. It. Yeah, I think I think uranium uranium is going to go on a massive spike. So, for example, Amazon. Right, has just signed a, a, a deal to buy a stake in a nuclear energy developer. Right, we it's it's kind of really interesting. I was talking about SpaceX with helium, Amazon with this. Bill Gates is going into copper. All of these kind of massive, you know, we talk about the, like the Magnificent Seven, right? And and you know, Nvidia and Microsoft and those huge bull runs. So it's all underpinned by materials, and there's not enough copper, nickel, uranium for you know energy production. I think is going to be a big, big thing because at the moment we we have this kind of push towards sort of clean energy and solar and wind, and it does have a place, but nuclear is the way forward. I think it's what most people, practical people in the world, say nuclear is the way forward in terms of powering the world. And then on top of that, obviously, the world's largest uranium producer, Kazakhstan, constantly... I mean, I remember writing articles for IG a couple of years ago where, in fact, it looked like the government would collapse and all the uranium out of Kazakhstan would stop being produced. And, and you know, geopolitically, you want to get uranium out of Canada rather than Kazakhstan um, and Australia, obviously, as well. I mean, Australia doesn't have its own nuclear plants. And we kind of have this mad kind of flip-flopping world where, like, Germany, for example, said, right, we will get rid of all our nuclear plants and rely on Russia for oil and gas. It didn't work out so well for them, and now their economy is flatlining. But what, what you know, if we want to talk specifically on power metal and what Sean, you know, the joint venture that signed with um, ACAM, uh, amazing. 
you know, there's up to 16, I think it was up to 16.2 million pounds to, in terms of value. So that joint venture alone is worth, you know, Power Metals market cap. All that exploration that's going to be done on licenses that were staked by the former CEO, Paul Johnson, for effectively, you know, five pence. Amazing. But I, I think uranium is going to go on a huge bull run at some point. Well, we're over the next two or three years, because people are going to realise that nuclear is the way forward. Yeah. And and the just other supplies that are dying. Nuclear, I don't know if you saw, Charles, but there was an announcement this week about a company, a US company called Last Energy, and they've apparently, they're an expanding US company that they specialise in building these, you know, these like small modular reactors, basically. Well, like Rolls-Royce. A bit like Rolls-Royce. Yeah. And they've actually got four micro plants planned in Bridge End in Wales, which they reckon they can bring online by 2030. So there are companies now that are actually using their ability to actually put these small plans into in, in, into operation. Yeah, yeah. It's really frustrating. The Rolls Royce is plowing ahead in Poland where they've just given them the sign off. We've yeah. been, you know, excuse the French, well, I'll use the word, fucking about for the past few years. The Rolls Royce, but Tom Sanson, who used to his head up, and I think he's left the unit now because he's so, he's fed up of dealing with the UK government. We've put it out to tender to multiple companies. Rolls Royce has been the best forever. They've been ready to go for years. Why are they not just allowed to build the damn things? We need them. And it's really funny because you can read, and I have read for other clients, research into um, small modular reactors from sort of 15, 20 years ago, and every single report said it will only be ready in 20 years' time. It's mm-hmm. like, yes, that's true, but we're still going to be here in 20 years' time. And it's, they're making the same arguments now. They're saying, well, we're not going to see the benefit of spending this money until 20 years down the line. It's like, yeah, most of us will be alive, as will our children, and we're still going to need energy. Why are we not just building these things? I mean, the only real kind of, if you're not on a fault line or in a war zone, the only real danger of nuclear is, is the waste that you produce afterwards. Where do, and at the moment you just bury it right and, and and you know kind of cross your fingers that no one's going to dig it up obviously the, the only other potentially the only other risk is strategic in the war as we've learned from ukraine but nuclear is the way forward and, and it's to my, to my mind it's incredibly frustrating when you've got rolls royce that has designed all of the plants has everything ready to grow they're the size of two football fields right and produce no emissions you could put it next to my house and i wouldn't mind right one field away from me no problem mm. if you put a massive coal plant next to me i'd be quite pissed sure. but do you know, we can do it. Why are we not just building them? It's so yeah. frustrating. And it, yeah. loads of jobs, loads of money, energy security, and they're just not doing it. Yeah, these these ones that I've seen are like, are like even smaller than that. They're like almost like Lego boxes. That, they're 20 megawatts per installation, and I'm, they're, they're planning four in Bridge End. So there's going to be about 80 megawatts total, and it's going to cost about 300 million. So it's a lot of energy to, um, to you know to produce there, to put into the grid. Um, and as you say, what, why not? Why aren't we encouraging companies in the UK on helping fund you know Rolls-Royce to, to be able to deliver this? Just it's frustrating. I mean, the other thing is, you know, if Rolls Royce came to the market because they already have the small module that is still its own yeah. separate division, but if they spun it off, you know, because maybe the government doesn't, and they said, right, we want to raise a billion pounds, you'd have that money raised tomorrow. Investors are ready to put that money in. Private investors, quite happily. Why are we not doing it? Because we'll put money into solar and into wind. Nuclear is more reliable. The investment money is there. They, the, the UK government just needs to say yes, let's do it. And then you have Poland who's benefiting from all of the research that we've, you know, because bear in mind the UK government has a golden share in Rolls-Royce, so we've put loads of money into it. When Rolls-Royce was kind of dying, we backed it a lot a couple of years ago during the pandemic, and yet Poland is benefiting from all of that expertise, and they're going to get the nuclear power that we should definitely have as well. It's just mental. Anyway. Yeah, well, coming back to the question, after you go on your soapbox, um, the power metal thing is uh, is very interesting. And in that basin that we discussed, it seems like the potential for uh, uranium discoveries are uh, are pretty high. Yeah. Okay. Good. Would you yeah. agree or not? What, uranium? Can't... Yes, the potential is very high. Some of them have already done pretty well, to be fair, but the potential to go higher. Uh, just power metal, it just, just astonishes me that it just won't move when when it's, it's shareholding in gold in guardian metal is probably worth its market cap at the moment the, the bloody joint venture with acam is worth its market cap what's going on in saudi is probably worth its market cap as well and yet it's just not moving up don't know why people just don't want to buy it aim is broken for now yep i think there's at least three projects and and there's more than those three projects as well as you well know there is a, is a there is a lot more I think there is, there was a query about whether there was enough cash available, but I think I think the cash is going to come. Well, you know, they're going to have cash. Well, the last two raising they did one with Rick Rule at a premium, and then the next one they did I can't remember strategic, and then that was also at a premium. You know, so they've done two raises at a premium, 
and presumably the next one they'll get the money somehow without having to do dilution you know, Sean's good at that, and it'll come out of Saudi. That's my hope. Joe, I want your take on Greatland as well. You, you did allude to Greatland earlier on, uh, Charles. So we obviously saw the um, some milestones reached this week, which include the receiving the Foreign Investment Review Board, FIRB, approval from Australia, and then ministerial consent for mining tenement transfers, and then a 10-year renewal of the Telfer environmental license. Plus, we obviously saw Greatland shareholders overwhelmingly approve the acquisition and associated equity raise with 99.75% in favour. So what did you make of that? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of conditions that need, that there's remaining conditions that need to be satisfied. We spoke to Sean last week. He was pretty chipper about the whole thing. What do you make of that whole kind of acquisition process? I think that, you know, Greyland, Greyland's, in terms of value accretion, was an amazing deal, you know? And obviously, it, I think it was like the placing was 4.8 years back to 6.5. I think now, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding because when you plug the numbers into a calculator and look at the free cash flow from Telfer alone, forget you know, have Aaron in like 2027, then you're making, you're making, you know, like a substantial uh, amount of capital, you know, regardless of whether Newmont is going to hand over Telfer in like a decent condition, which, you know, that they're, they're required to contractually. The question is, you know, we spoke to Sean, you know, relatively recently, the question is, you know, in practice, how much profit, how much gold are you going to get out of Telfer? How much profit are you going to get out? Your CapEx costs are going to be fairly high. One would assume, you know, I've looked at them, they, they've risen. But the proof is in the pudding. You know, Telfer's restarted now, right? So presumably we're going to find out very soon how much actual gold they're getting out of the ground. Yeah. And that could be the RNS that send it soaring into the sky. Yeah, but I'm I looking think... forward to seeing what the what the copper revenues are. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And the gold, like the, the you know the Dore, as he mentioned, the fact that they can produce this this you know high concentrate, probably ninety five percent Dore, and then move it onto the mint. And then they've got also the byproduct, the copper, the copper alone, they can produce a decent concentrate from what I can gather. So I don't know what what the free cash flow is is going to be, but as you say, surely there'll be some numbers. Yeah, I just got my. Pack out and did it based on. I did it too. Go on, that's what it. Sean did uh, last week, which yeah. was saying there's 550,000 ounces of gold can um, contain. Now, some of that might be copper, some of it gold, but that's basically the, the total. And you put a $1,200 margin in that, assuming now gold today has just gone over $2,700, which gives you an all in sustaining cost of $1,500 or more. So $1,200 doesn't seem over the top. That gives you $660 million US dollars free cash flow. So that that is about £480 million pounds a year. Yeah. It sounds so, crazy, though. This is the thing. It sounds crazy high numbers. So what, does it, what would be a good, if we divide that by 1.31, it's 503 million pounds a year what would be a a good um you know pe ratio on 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 that because that's profit really i mean i know we said it's not cap, net cash flow but it can be put into haveron for one which would mm-hmm. reduce the amount that they have to borrow uh, alternatively it could be to explore other things but regardless of how the cash is used how would a company in that situation be valued with a haver on with 20 year mine life, I'll tell for probably going to be extended beyond 18 months. It's more likely to be a few years, you would imagine. Even if the costs are a bit higher, it makes more sense. So, what do you reckon, Charles? What what would be a decent P ratio? Uh, this is the problem, right? Because it, it sounds ridiculous. This is the thing compared to what the share price is now. I think Charles is still hoping for his 4.8p. That's why he's very reluctant to comment on this. <laughs> Not <laughs> at all. Numbers. No, I, I, I think the other thing is is that even if Telfer, you know, you do some more exploration, every other package of land. I was literally I was speaking to uh, to uh, George Artemis just before I got on this call, and he was saying literally, every, I was saying to him, every other package of land around Telfer and Javier on is going to probably be explored by a joint venture with Greatland. So all of that gold is going to go through them as well. And Greatland can pretty much dictate the terms, you know, to some degree. How, how, how do you value it? A hell of a lot higher than what it is now. But what I will say, you know, I was, I was saying it before about kind of theory and practice, is that when you get that first RNS saying this is our free cash flow from our first three months of operations, that could be the trigger to send it really, really high to shoot it up. But until yeah. you get that, you know, people people are gonna people are gonna like uh, be risk averse because that's what people are like in the market at the moment. 
but if I can't put a number on it. If yet. you use a PE of six, I just don't then, don't say it. <laughs> then you have a three billion pound valuation. Yes, you will. You will. The PE of six is too low to be fair as well. It's more like eight. Yeah, yeah. And and, and its current market cap is six hundred and seventy-eight million. So yeah, probably right f- around about five times its current price. So it could could go back to its all time highs in the thirty piece. Yes, it, could. it could. I think it could. I hope it does. I don't think this time that would be on fluff either. That would be on on fully on balance fundamentals. sheet. Yeah, yeah. On, on balance sheet and fundamentals, and yeah, I mean. Probably Sean will not like me for saying it, but he was basically a bit surprised share price hadn't gone up. That was his comment. I think you know, I'll tell it's, it's off the record. Off the record. Off the record. Well, I think it's it's basically for me. It's simple. It's it's because um, until you actually see those numbers, it's hard to believe them given how you know effectively cheap they purchase the assets for. I mean, I've done a fair bit of work into Greatland that um, the depending on how you wanted to. Uh, value uh, Newmont's uh, Telfer and Newmont seventy per share of Harry on it, it could be at, you know in below hundreds of millions to like one point two billion plus in terms of US dollars. So it's it's difficult to know how to value Greatland. But then the second they start producing that amount of gold, you know, then it, it, then you're away. And now I think the share price is going to absolutely explode. I hope so anyway. Bruce in the pudding on that one. Right, let's move on. So Bazan Resources announced they received notice of preparedness for granting of mining license 246 for the Open Gorob Copper Gold project in Namibia, where it holds a 70% interest. The license is expected to be granted once the company submits a written acceptance with the process underway. We spoke to Colin earlier in the week, and obviously we, we went into a little bit of that information. But uh, what what did you make of that one, Charles? Just give us your thoughts on the whole Hope and Gorob and what potentially what could happen going forward. Well, I think the first thing is, you know, like we were only on the phone briefly to Colin, but he's so enthusiastic. I think for the first time in a while, he think you know. The big thing for me is this mining license is um, I don't think the idea is to do lots of exploration straight away. I think it's, you know, I think personally they need to develop, they need to use it, they need to develop it, they need to start generating capital. Now I've done the um, back of a fag packet in terms of like what kind of cost you might be, but I'm thinking sort of somewhere in the, in the region of 10 to 15 million US dollars um, capital requirement. And then given that you're looking at, you know, sulfides rather than oxides, it can be easily processed. You've got 15 million tons. It's possible potentially that you could, you know, truck this copper to you know, plenty of plants nearby. You could do processing. I mean, you could be looking at 20 million dollars in free cash flow from this one asset, possibly within the next sort of six to nine months. And the market cap, what's the market cap like at now, Phil? It's like 3.5, 3, 3 yeah. no, about 3 yeah. million. Three million. Well, what, so about, what about nothing? Uh, what about the ore from uh, African Pioneers on Bongo, hundred percent owned and mining license, which is on the railroad from Windhoek straight uh, straight to the plant? Well, again, exactly the same. I think these uh, I'm trying to figure the words like copper. One of kind of the fallacies that we have is that you need to find like a massive tier one copper deposit in order to you know generate some income, but you really don't because the tier one copper deposits you. A, you've got to sell it to a major, which takes a thousand years, and B, the major has to develop it, which generally takes about 20 years now. These kind of mid-tier kind of deposits that you have, you can get them up and running in less than a year. You've got the water there, you've got the electricity there. Um, in fact, there would be a Besson, you know, RNS something about the electricity, they, they've got access to the solar. So all of these projects, as long as they, you know, they've got a decent amount of commercial copper, it have the ability to to generate real decent cash flow in the near term. I think that's the key thing in the near term, so we're in the next year. Um, this is what I want to see from Bevan. I, 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 you know, African Pioneer, yes, they've got wonderful assets. Extract, yes, they've got wonderful assets. Um, but Bezant, they've got this mining license. I know Galileo got the mining license for Mansobi and they're doing more exploration, but Bezant, I don't think you need to do that. You already know you've got the copper there. There's a very easy and obvious path to production. Just get producing and make some money. And then once you've got free cash flow, you can use it to explore the entire area, and, and, and that's a very prospective area. Yeah, have you got? So, have you guys ever seen it? Have you ever been out there? Yeah, yeah, we've we've been yeah, to yeah. Namibia and seen the yeah. site. It's right in the middle of the Gobabab Desert, which is it's literally like being on the moon. I mean, there are there are some but reportedly some tracks in the sand there in in the desert that are from the Second World War. Some of the some of the tanks that are still preserved. That's how kind of like it's it's just amazing place. But I mean, I was just looking at some of the previous RNSs, and and it was like fifteen million tons at around one point five percent copper equivalent, with with a gold credit of like point two grams to point four grams per ton, 
And I think the plan is to is to upgrade it on site, and as you say, maybe truck it off to a nearby facility with with the propensity to to develop around one hundred eighty thousand tons of contained copper, mm-hmm. about three and a half percent. So, so what what would that what sort of figures would you think from those numbers there, Charles, in terms of sort of free cash flow on an annual basis? Well, like I said, somewhere around the twenty million US mark, but obviously, you know. People look at that and go, oh, you know, it's only 20 million. We're talking about Greatland Gold and their 3 billion <laughs> potential valuation. But 20 million when your market cap is only three and a half, you know, that's very decent. And the other thing is that presumably because you're not going to be able to raise, you know, I say you know, minimum capex is going to be 10 million, maybe 15 tops. You're not going to be able to raise that through dilution. Yeah. And so it's going to have to be through some kind of joint venture or SPV or something along those lines. So somebody else is going to pay for that capex. You may not get the whole 20 million to yourself. But, you know, even even if you're getting, you know, half of that or just over half, you're, you're making four times your market cap every year and you could be doing it from June. So this this is one, you know, Bezan, I, I think, I'll be honest, you know, I think most people who have been either in the stock or looking at the stock have just been waiting for this mining license for a couple of years. I think Kev, you'd probably agree with that. Uh, having now got it, we na- it now needs to say, right, we're going to accelerate. We're going to produce as quickly as possible. Pick a yeah, we were, we were there in February, right? Yeah. Okay. And at that time, we spoke with various different people from the company, and the mining license was coming like the next week. And we've waited <laughs> this long, okay? And and it is a government issue. There is no doubt about that. But they've done their due diligence, and they've now got this. But we went we went to the site where the drilling has taken place in the past, and uh, you know we picked up the the ore. I probably I still have some in the office here. I think. Uh, I bought a piece of the or some of the ore back, the the copper stuff. And there is existing mining that has taken place, but not for copper, close by. And there are facilities there within one or two kilometers. There is a rail line that takes you all the way from Vindhuk and uh, Ongombo's African Pioneer license. And they have a mining license as well. And they can mm-hmm. basically dig it up as well in an open pit basis. That line... Train line takes you through through the um, the plant that is there now, and also onto Wolvis Bay, which is one of the deepest ports, I think, where that you can then export the stuff. There is a workforce in both Wolvis Bay and um, Swakopmund, where we stayed. So yeah, and we're talking about seventeen kilometers of strike. So the numbers we've talked about are not anywhere near what the total potential. Total yeah, potential is, um, and obviously we shouldn't talk just about the potential. We should talk about what is actually yes, that's the. And the other thing, so is I think this has been a crown jewel to try and get yeah. for Colin Burt to then basically become one of the one of the main operators uh, for copper anyway, and maybe other things, copper and gold in Namibia. Yeah, and I think that's what's going to happen personally. So, so just to come back onto the solar element as well, because people are probably thinking, well, how are they going to, you know, how are they going to get the energy to site? But they, they did announce back in a um, few months ago that they, the company called Cross Boundary Energy, will assume responsibility for the financing and implementation of this solar hybrid system. And they signed a letter of intent, and uh, there's no advance payments that are required from Bazan at all, and it's based on a 15-year contract term, and it's effectively the life of mine working with with a co-developer, Eversolar, who will be responsible for the whole EPC of the project. So all looks good. They've got the solar in, you know, ready to go in in place. That'll be installed, and then obviously there'll be some sort of like a, a payment system that they'll put into that for for the you know for the energy. So it looks like a good deal. Yeah, I think so, and I think. On the energy in particular, the producers like to sell to miners because they know they're going to get paid, right? Yeah. Where, whereas often you you sell to other businesses and it's hard. They they have a um they have they have some level of control the energy suppliers because if you don't pay us our invoice, your mine stops reducing. But they also yeah, know yeah. the mines can afford it. Yeah. So Rickus Rickus uh, for Jubilee Metals was telling us uh, about the South African suppliers of these. Uh, the Jubilee's about to do or, or did do business with, but also there is ones in uh, in South Africa as well. That was the, I think they did this with the Norwegian company that is based in Zambia as well. Mm. But effectively, the, these companies are designed to pay all the capex and then, and then it's just a fixed payment for the, yeah. uh, for the electricity that they produce. 
over a fixed period of time. So they pays it off, doesn't it? Pays the project yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Pays the project. They make handsome profit themselves, and you get security of um, energy for well, yeah, for the time. Well, Asia Met and Indonesia have exactly the same kind of model for energy. I can't remember what the model's called, but yes. Somebody else builds it and supplies you the energy and it pays it all off. And to be honest, I mean, I know we're, we're kind of in exploration, but Zambia in particular is a really good example because it's pretty, the whole country is powered by hydroelectric and they're in drought. So anyone yeah. who's got a solar plant is making, printing money effectively. Um, and obviously, obviously, uh, Jubilee is, is sort of their, their energy out for, you know, a solar provider. But actually, in terms of a growth potential, if you're looking at Zambia, Botswana and Namibia, solar plants, there's actually a way to make a hell of a lot of money. Because you have, you know, guaranteed uh, energy coming out and the demand is, is there and they'll pay for it. Okay. Yeah. So let, let's move on because it's, it's, it's going to be a long one. So it, movers and shakers of the week, we've seen Cloud Coco up some 170%. They agreed to sell the subsidiary Cloud Coco Connect to the BE company for 250000 including some liabilities, which I think exceeded £1.7 million. Pounds, uh, proceeds used for working capital. So that one moved extremely well. Prem up 40%. I, I don't really know much about Premier Africa, Charles. I know it's one of your, uh, not your favourites, but you know quite a lot about it and stuff. So well, what what is going the... on there, Charles? What's going on? Well, it's the simple basics, which is George Roche, the CEO, needs more money to make the plant work. But, you know, it's about, what, a year and a half, maybe, past where it should have been producing. Um, I was going to say, how long has he been trying to make this plant work? Because oh, it's know. quite a long time. I mean, the problem the problem with it, I mean, there, there, there's lots of, I mean, we can talk about this forever and ever and ever, but I think um, they, the basic thing is that in April next year, the debt that uh, Prem has to Camax, their, uh, their uh, offtake partner, gets converted potentially into equity in Zulu, which is the uh, lithium asset. And so potentially George is waiting for that to happen and then going to try and strike another deal. I, I, think, I think it's not helped that the lithium price is kind of in the doldrums. But at the end of the day, the basic thing that's happened to the, is that the plant just hasn't worked and continues to not work. And, and, and you know, what back are the in challenges? The... What are the challenges, Charles? I mean, oh, I, there's I'm so not... many challenges to it. I mean, we, 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 could, we could talk through the technicals for ages, but the basic point is that back in November last year, where we kind of hit kind of like a, it has to work now, and it yeah. didn't. That's the point at which Premier African Minerals should have either raised a you know a decent chunk of change at a reasonable share price so that they could fix everything or gone down the joint venture route. Instead, they pushed it off and tried to keep fixing it with small amounts of money and it just hasn't worked. I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's frustrating for me personally because I, I thought it was one that could do really, really well. Um, and, and, you know, it's not something that I think is in any danger of going bankrupt anytime soon because they'll continue to be able to raise money. But the danger is the dilution because yeah. they continue to ask for more shares and place more shares on the market. And even if the thing works in the future, you know, you might have owned, you know, 0.1% of the company or own 0.0001 by the time you're done. That's the real danger. But, you know, the thing is, it shoot, it, it's going to shoot up and down now because the share price is so low and it is incredibly liquid. And if the damn plant ever does just work, then, you know, based on, you know, the, the, the cost of operating in Zimbabwe, then you'll make a lot of money from it. So, you know, it's just how long will that take? And the problem is, is that when you're told one or two months continuously for a year and a half, you know, if people don't believe it anymore. It starts to grind you down, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay, so the other one that's the the, big, the biggest shaker of the week was was Emerson. Um, they're down some seventy percent. Basically, that we know about the the big chemiset um, potash development project in Morocco. They had received unfavorable recommendation from the Regional Investment Commission (CRUI) regarding the approval of the updated environmental and social impact assessment for the chemiset project. While the company awaits fi formal notification, it is exploring legal and regulatory options for appeal and will update further as more information becomes available. So, I mean, obviously, the, there's going to be potentially big delays for the for the project's progress and potentially impacting any you know future timelines and development. But what do you make of that? I mean, it's a big drop on it, and I actually quite like this project, but it's always mm. it's always seems to be fraught with um like you know bureaucracy and procedure and, and and trying to bring it online well i think i you know my, my personal perspective is that there's another player with deeper pockets in the region who wants that asset and is going to do whatever it can to get control of it and emerson just doesn't have the financial firepower now you know potentially they can borrow some money from somebody to go down the legal route and and you know fight and protest and it might be a, you know a few days from now you get an rns that just says oh no sorry we were wrong it's absolutely fine because nothing official has actually been, you know, RNS yet, as far as I'm aware. But to me, it's 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 a classic that another player in the region wants it, and they've gone, you know, to the government or to you know the licensing um, authority and gone, look, we want this thing. 
and uh, and uh, don't give it to Anderson. They just go, oh, okay, fine. You pay the brown paper envelope. Should I say that publicly? Probably not, but this is kind of. <laughs> he just did. Oh no! But it's kind of. This is it. Kind of. That's exactly what it looks like to me. I think you should say thinking? maybe that's what this is. Maybe. Yes, very do we government the, forces. The do, do we think do we think Moroccan government forces or a bigger player, another you know, a big a bigger company? I wouldn't be surprised if it's a bigger company that wants a potash project like that. Yeah. I think do you know, and, and it's kind of interesting. Um I do I don't know the management of Emerson. I'd love to ask them. They probably wouldn't tell me, but but yeah. we should get them on and ask them direct. That'd be fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so anything else you want to talk about? We've we've talked long enough. Um, you know, anything else? Any other companies before we move on to something a bit more? Um... The the only thing I would say. So we've got um drilling results from Arc Minerals and Rome Resources. Um, are both coming out before the end of the month. So Arc from Botswana and the Virgo licenses, which are obviously relevant to everything else in the region, and then Rome Democratic Republic of the Congo right next to Alpha Men. And so expectations for both of those are really high. We're kind of really excited, you know, potentially as early as next week, but by the end of the month. So both of those two, we should keep an eye on. And then and then the, the only other one is Alien Metals, because they have potentially two joint ventures for their assets in this quarter. Um, hopefully we're going to get them signed off, um, both of those two. So those companies we should be keeping an eye on. What about you guys? Anything interesting? You can That's news from Materian this week, didn't I, Phil? Oh, did you? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Ethereum that, that there's some some licensing in Morocco, and also there was there was they they'd actually announced that they'd pulled operations on their um, trading arm, hadn't they, in in Rwanda? So, oh, isn't that what? Um, oh, well, Rick Rule said that was a bad idea. So interesting. Maybe they maybe they listened and said that. Yeah, Rick Rule was basically giving the trading operations zero valuation anyway. And I was mm. having a discussion with someone else this week. The 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 reality is this is a play on. Lithium in Rwanda, Rio Tinto moved into the country. They're not even in the country before this deal um, on the basis of this. I think lithium's a funny one because we had, we had not a bubble, but we had a big, like everybody getting excited about lithium uh, two, three years ago. And it's really calmed, up, calmed down now because the Chinese basically, have, should I say it, manipulated the price. But basically now possibly an oversupply of lithium um, has, has reduced the price. Lithium is required. I mean, it can be substituted, but it is required in in many of the things that are are required for the batteries um, and many, many, many other things. So I think that the lithium and people like Rio being involved in that are, you know, very, very important. And also it should be quite exciting in the next few months because we're going to get some results. They're going to start drilling now and see seeing what happens. The other thing is they have many, many licenses in uh, in Morocco for copper and uh, and very high readings of silver as well and some of those as well. So again, I can see a JV in Morocco coming about in the next while. And uh, yeah, for a company that's valued as lowly, lowly as it is with a JV with uh, Rio Tinto, uh, doesn't doesn't and really have. Got, don't forget they've also got the licenses in in Botswana as well. Botswana as yeah. well. Yeah. Well, so I think Ethereum is it, it, it should definitely be on everyone's list. I think while we're on Morocco, I just remembered there's one more that you know kind of caught my eye last week: a Predator Oil and Gas, because MOU five uh, located onshore Morocco. There's the well targeting a gas prospect of five point nine trillion cubic feet, and you know they said distinct possibility of helium as well. You know, classic because helium's you know the heat of the hot thing. But Predator has caught a lot of interest with investors. I think that one could do really really well because they're with license. But yeah, I mean, Mor- Mor- Morocco, I mean, this is the thing, right? We're, we're talking about how many companies have we covered now? So 15, 20 so far today? Like, oh, there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of interest is coming back into this sector because companies are actually getting cracking and doing stuff that people want to see. Exploration yep. and mining licenses and money to be made. But if you look at the overall value of all of these companies, the vast majority of them are lower than they were at the start of the year. And yet the vast majority of them have progressed now yeah. some have some have hit stumbling blocks you know you talked about premier the it's been messing about trying to get the lithium out for for well over a year now and and probably should be lower valued because ultimately it's it's not doing what it said it was going to do on the tin you know but you've got many other companies that in in the scenario that have made progress but their share prices haven't responded 
this is the frustrating thing about the market and why we're saying, well, is the market broken? Well, okay. a market can't stay broken forever, is, right. is my statement. You know, it, it cannot stay broken forever. That valuation is going to be corrected in one of two or three ways. One, the market itself will correct and therefore the value will go up. Two, private equity will come in and the market purchase it. Yeah. Or three, the company will go private itself and just yeah. say, forget it. I'm not even going to go with the market. Well, I think it's, um, and this is what I was saying at the start, is cash generation, right? When we talk about Greatland Gold, they're cash, you know, companies that are cash generating. Well, Amarok Minerals, they got first gold this quarter, cash generating, you know, you know, Bezant and their uh, mining license. Five years ago, I would have said, no, what you should do is you should drill more and do more exploration. Now you need to generate cash. Because yeah. cash yeah. generation is what re-rates the market caps. When you, you know, and I think in particular, a core part of this is knowing that you've got enough cash being made that you don't need to raise to pay for working capital. You know, I think like a lot of companies could do worse and just have ten million in an investment account, corporate investment account, and just you know make ten percent a year and use that money to cover their working capital costs every year. You know, but I I, I think capital cool. generation is is where it's at. It's why the helium plays are so popular because. You're even not, it's even not going to work. But if it does work, then it's going to be making money very quickly. But yeah, yeah I, I think because there's not, not a lot of the, not a lot of um, capex basically to take the helium and send it somewhere. Exactly. And generally, you're, 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 um, in the case of Mendel, where you know, the Jackdaw plant is right there. But just as a general rule, I mean, the, the way the industry works, if you find the helium, then somebody else comes and builds the plant right next to you um, and you just sell the helium to them effectively and, and and that's an easy way to make money and a lot of these plants are mobile as well if you have a psg plant when the well runs dry they just move on to the next one yeah. so it's it's really low capex really easy to do but you just have to find the damn stuff and that, that's that's the hard bit that's why you need the experts but you know these companies have got some decent people in charge of them okay i think we should wrap things up for now obviously I want to say thanks for listening and obviously thanks charles for guesting on the podcast always great to, to hear your insights but we're going to finish with a tribute to someone who, who sadly passed away this week, founder and executive chairman of Conroy Gold and Natural Resources, Professor Richard Conroy, passed away after a short illness. Um, on behalf of the board, John Sherman, deputy chairman of Conroy, commented, Richard will be missed by us all. His immense contribution to and achievements within medicine, Irish politics and mineral exploration globally and in the respect of all. He was an entrepreneur to the very end, building a vision that Ireland would become a world leader in exploration and mining. Following on from leading the development of a major zinc mine in Galmoy, his vision founded in knowledge of gold evidenced in an antimony mine in Clontibret was that Ireland was an emerging gold province with significant potential for economic scale ore bodies. Inspired by his tenacity, we recommit ourselves as a company to deliver on Richard's vision. So we've interviewed R Richard numerous times for Conroy and obviously Karelian and also met him a few times in person. And he was always a force to be reckoned with. True gentleman, and we at the roast will miss him dearly. So we leave you with some words from Richard after I posed this question to him earlier in the year. So um, we'd normally ask you what you you know being on the Sunday roast, Richard, what, what your favourite food is. But we we know it's absolutely the best beef, obviously well cooked, well done, as you say. But we're going to mix it up a little bit and change things. We're going to ask you what's the best advice you've ever heard or received. Probably to make your decisions with great care and blend in those decisions ideas when some people all of us have very good ideas at times but to combine those with the reality of accomplishing them that requires two things and uh, one is that you have to see things look at them in a fresh light and if you do it's surprising what you see there's a tradition which i myself experienced if you've ever been to Africa or ever been to, to one of the places uh, there, I walked with a chap, a guide, and he pointed out a tree to me a couple of hundred yards away. And he said, what do I see? And I said, I see a tree. What else do you see? And I looked and looked very hard, and all I was still seeing was the tree. But I knew there must be something there. And a moment later, the deer or antelope that was there made a slight movement, and suddenly it all became very obvious. And I think if I were giving advice to someone, it would be along those lines. Look, look at something that may seem very familiar, very obvious, very definite. Just check, is there anything extra about it? Is there anything different about it? 
and then in a very purposeful manner approach or do do whatever you decide to do in any industry. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, gold, gold, other industries, the mining section, or things totally different. There are certain basic principles uh, which apply. There's always luck, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's something that's totally outside your control, except that if you've taken a measured, very hard-working approach to something, sometimes that comes along as well. This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.